you start um, cutting out carbohydrates from your diet, indeed what happened to this study where it goes from an average, you know, the average person's eating about 50 to 60% of their calories from carbohydrate. When you go to a low carbohydrate diet, you're cutting that down to a fifth or a sixth or you know, a tenth of the amount of calories. So in this study in particular, they went from about 50% of their calories from carbs down to 8%, so, which is pretty typical um, when you adhere to a low carb diet. Of course, if you start putting less glucose into the system, uh, the body starts making more. There are these natural counter-regulatory mechanisms, which is why glucose levels stay normal. If you take someone who has normal glucose and they adopt a low-carb diet, their glucose will stay normal. It'll continue to hover around 80 milligrams per deciliter. It stays normal because the liver begins making more glucose to make up for the lack of glucose coming in. Now, this is relevant to cortisol because there are a small little cluster of hormones that will stimulate the liver to turn on this release of glucose. Growth hormone will do some of this. Uh, cortisol will, and epinephrine will, and glucagon. Those are really the main four that are going to be stimulating the liver to make more glucose. And of course, there's a reason for that when that happens. So there is a lot of um, suspicion that if you adopt a low-carb diet, one of the ways you're keeping your glucose normal is because the cortisol is coming in and it's pushing the, the liver to continue to make glucose. Now, the glucose uh, maintenance effect of cortisol is only one. In fact, it's maybe the most benign. Cortisol is a hormone that can, it'll basically destroy everything in order to increase glucose, including stripping proteins from things like your muscles and your bones to get those amino acids, to send those amino acids to the liver, and then tell the liver to convert those amino acids into more glucose. Um, in addition to reducing the immune system as well uh, and changing the way the body stores fat, suffice it to say, cortisol is a hormone we do not want elevated for very long. So it's reasonable to be concerned. Is a low-carb diet going to spike my cortisol? These are the two studies I've seen that look at cortisol in average people, not in the context of, say, an exercise type study. So some basics on this study. Um, it's body yeah. composition and hormonal responses to a carbohydrate-restricted diet. This is some of the work from the legendary low-carb scientist Jeff Volick while he was at Connecticut. So in this study, the first point, which I think is interesting, they, they have a control group and then the diet group put on a low-carb ketogenic diet. The group that was put on the low-carb ketogenic diet, they volunteered for the diet. They volunteered for that, which does introduce perhaps a problem from the scientific side. But again, the pragmatist in me says, well, that's more, it's more real life. Right. And they're going to adhere to the diet better because they wanted to do it. Yeah. Now, they were all considered healthy going in. Um, and, and same body weight. The low-carb diet, they transitioned. I mentioned the carbohydrate transition. They went from around 50% down to 8%. And then on um, table one, where they described the macronutrient breakdown, they um, were eating, they went up to eating about 170 grams of protein and about 160 grams of fat. And there we go to that magic one-to-one um, by mass ratio, by mass, the fat and the protein is about one to one, which by percent of calorie ends up being 60% fat-ish, 30% protein. And that's, that's, that's a great range. And interestingly, um, sort of conventional keto thinking um, worries about protein because of the insulin spike. Interestingly, in this diet group, they were eating twice as much protein as the control group. Mm twice as much protein, and yet their insulin, if we go to table three, the insulin in the diet group, the low-carb group, it changed from around 23 picomoles, which is high, down to 15, so a wow. significant reduction, whereas in the control group, which is eating half the amount of protein, it stayed in the low 20s. It didn't change at all. In fact, it actually tended to go up a bit, but it was within the margin of error, so it wasn't a significant change.